Amen. If you want to take your seat, go ahead and do that. It is just wonderful, wonderful privilege uh, to be with you again and such uh, an encouragement to see so many people out on a wet Monday night. Well done. And uh, thank you. Thank you again so much for the honour of being able to share in this. Um, as Aaron has said, we are uh, doing three nights of sort of teaching and then at the end, a sort of a worship night, ministry night, maybe some of that teaching coming to a culmination in a fourth night together of ministry and worship. And uh, our theme for the whole month is this idea of walking with the Spirit. Now, let me just say, just practically, first of all, you will be getting notes. So um, you can take some notes. I would encourage you to anything that grabs you, then then why don't you write that down and sort of think about that. Um, if if you want the, the sort of the PDFs, the slides that are up on the screen, I can sort it all out for you. But notes will be coming to you. But really right at the beginning, a couple of things I want to say. And this is so, so important for us. When Jesus was leaving his young disciples, he said this, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan or orphans, but I'm going to send another to you. And that word another there is, is the idea of another just like me. And one of the first things I just want you, before we even get into, just want you to be open to is that the Holy Spirit is not an it. He's not a force. He's not a thing. It's not just uh, an impersonal power. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not just a person, but he is the person of God. And actually the Holy Spirit has come because Jesus has gone. Uh, and I know there's a sense in which we believe Jesus is with us always, but, but there's a sense physically Jesus left the earth and he sent the Holy Spirit to his church, to his gathered community, so that we didn't have to do life alone, so that we didn't have to do our faith alone, and so that we didn't have to walk alone. But of course, what does that look like? And, and this is the challenge. What does the Holy Spirit coming look like for us in the 21st century world. And we're going to think about three massive ideas that hopefully will help you. Now, if you're like me and you've been a Christian for like a million years or so, this is still worthwhile leaning into because uh, we are called not just to be filled with the Spirit, but to be continuously filled with the Spirit and to be open to the Holy Spirit. So we're going to think about tonight uh, the idea of being filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? And if, if uh, this is such an important idea and experience, how do we open up ourselves and engage with that? And is this idea still for the 21st century world? So we're going to lean into that tonight. That's going to be our sort of gateway conversation. And then next week, we're going to look at the idea of being filled to flow. Now, within that, we're going to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So not only has the Holy Spirit want to come in power in our lives, but the New Testament talks about special gifts that the Holy Spirit wants to deposit in individuals and in his church community. He wants to give us some stuff that helps us uh, uh, function and operate in, in, in not only the world out there, but even enrich and equip our world in here. And he's given us special gifts to help with that. And these are, these are spiritual gifts sometimes we refer to them as. They're not just human gifts plus, but they are gifts specifically from the Holy Spirit. And we're going to think about those next week and what they look like in the church and what they might even look like out there uh, in Little and Aldi and Asda and Tesco's, okay? Is there a place for the gifts of the Spirit out in the world in which we live. And then in our last week together, at least my last week with you, we're going to look at filled to follow. And we're going to look at the fruit of the Spirit. So this idea that the Holy Spirit wants to form the character of God in us. And what does that look like? And how does he do it? And how can we cooperate with him? And so this series is deliberately entitled um, Walking with the Spirit. We, we, we want this understanding that the Holy Spirit will not impose himself on us, nor will he control us, nor will he manipulate us. But the Holy Spirit wants his church 
to cooperate with him, to walk with him, to engage with him, to desire him, to welcome him, to want him. And if if there's a community that opens up their heart to the Holy Spirit and says, Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, we want you. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Then the Bible teaches us the Holy Spirit will come. He will come to a community or to an individual that says in one form or another, I need you, I want you, and I welcome you. And actually, I believe that there is a great opportunity for the church today in the 21st century to, in a fresh way, come to the Holy Spirit. Pentecostalism, modern Pentecostalism that this church is a part of. We're part of the Assemblies of God denomination, which is a classical Pentecostal denomination. Pentecostalism in a modern form is, uh, well, just over a hundred years old. But the turn of the 20th century, there was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that started to spread in a brand new, fresh way across the earth. And today there are hundreds of millions of people who would claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic, that is, they've had a dynamic experience with the Holy Spirit and that has framed their way forward. This church would be would position itself as a Pentecostal church. What do we mean by that? We mean that we believe that the Holy Spirit we see at work In the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit we see at work in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit we see at work in the life of Jesus is the same Holy Spirit for us today and he wants to do the same things today that he did back then. Now I should say, and we'll get this out of the way right at the beginning, but let's get the elephant out of the room on this issue. There would be a section of the church of Jesus Christ uh, on the earth that believes that what we see in the book of Acts isn't for today. That sort of the work of the Holy Spirit was a sort of a beginning work, a work that got the church moving, got the church going. But the stuff that the the book of Acts sort of shows us, that's that beginning stuff. And we shouldn't expect that today. And language like... um, cessationist. You you may have come across that. People who believe that the work of the Spirit has ceased in the way that we see it in the New Testament. Now, I'm a card-carrying Pentecostal. I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. I speak in tongues every single day, and I would refute that idea, not just out of my experience. I would refute that theologically. There is not a single idea in the New Testament that suggests that the Holy Spirit's work has come to an end. Not one. And I think if you're going to do that, you have to work very, very, very hard on the text to make it say something it doesn't say. Now, I have many friends who would be cessationists. They do not believe in speaking in tongues. They don't believe that the God, that the Lord can speak through prophecy. They don't believe that people can be healed through these gifts of the Spirit. And they don't believe that there is a separate, distinct experience with the Holy Spirit called either the filling or the baptism of the Spirit. And I wouldn't want to uh, uh, fall out with any of my friends over that issue, but it is something for me that is not an optional extra. For me, this is fundamental. And sometimes people will say, well, you know, you Pentecostals, you, you believe that and that's okay for you. But no, I, I would respond, no, no, I, 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 I don't need this as a Pentecostal. I need this as a follower of Jesus. Right? This is not about me being a Pentecostal and you being of a different label. This is about us being power-filled followers of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit has come to empower each one of us. Now, it's, it's whether we engage with him or don't engage with him, that is now our choice. And that's the idea of walking with the Spirit. My desire is that followers of Jesus would engage with the Holy Spirit in the same way that Jesus' first followers engage with them and in the way that subsequent followers engage with them in the New Testament. And I believe that that is an invitation open to every person in this room. From the youngest person to the oldest, from the babyest Christian to the oldest Christian in this room, uh, whoever you are, if you are a lover of Jesus and a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is here for you. And he wants to bless you and he wants to fill you. He does not want to hurt you. He does not want to manipulate you. He does not want you to be afraid of him. He is not a force. He is not an it. He is not a thing. He is God. 
and he is the third person of the Trinity and he desperately wants to enrich and equip our lives. And, and that's, that's, that's my starting point. So that's my unapologetic beginning point, all right? I'm not here to sort of talk about, you know, is the Holy Spirit here for today? He is, in my opinion. That's my starting point. That's my ending point, And that's my middle point. And we'll talk about a whole bunch of things in, uh, uh, in and around that. So you're in a Pentecostal church. And I believe that this is a Pentecostal position, but not just a Pentecostal position. I, I firmly believe it's a biblical position uh, and, and you can feel free to disagree in any way. So, so that's, that's where we're going. Is that okay? So we're going to dive in. Here we go. We're going to read some bits of the Bible together and then uh, let's do a wee bit of teaching and then see where it goes tonight. Brilliant. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to read some bits of the Bible, as you can see from the screen, some readings from the Gospel of Luke and some readings from the book of Acts. And, uh, and just for the sake of time, we're just touching on them. You can read in more detail maybe later on. So here we go. Uh, Luke chapter three, verse 21. And it says this, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened. Look at that. Love that connection between praying and an open heaven. Heaven was opened as he was praying and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Now, Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He was the son, so it was thought of Joseph. And then we get a stack of beautiful names there, which I'll not read to you. You could read those yourself later on. Okay. Chapter four, verse one of Luke's gospel. So Jesus is now, the Holy Spirit has descended on him. So we're picking up the story after this genealogy. Chapter four, verse one, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days, he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and at the end of them he was hungry absolutely verse 14 so we've now gone to the end of the wilderness experience he's come out of that fasting experience verse 14 says this Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside he taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him he went to Nazareth where he'd been brought up and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him and unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Absolutely beautiful words. And then skip across to Acts chapter one and uh, just a couple of verses from Acts chapter one and Acts chapter two. Some of you will know that the book of Luke written by uh, Luke and then the book of Acts also written by Luke. It's sort of two parts of one story. So we're picking it up. Uh, and uh, let me just, let me just uh, in fact, instead of just reading verse eight, let me just read um, from uh, halfway through verse three. It says this, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Verse four, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when uh, they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to do the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and the Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then he go, he's taken up into heaven uh, the disciples return to Jerusalem. They're in the upper room together. And we pick the story up in chapter two, verse, verses one. And it says this, when the day of Pentecost came, 
They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Okay, so so actually... It's an important beginning point for us when thinking about being filled with the Spirit to lean into the writings of Dr. Luke. Now, the reason for that is when you put the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts together, Luke has a lot to say about the Holy Spirit. But not just in a sort of a teachy sense. He's not giving us a line by line uh, teaching on the Holy Spirit. He's not doing an A, B, C, D, E of the Holy Spirit. But what Luke does brilliantly, he's like showing us what it looks like when the Holy Spirit comes. Now, later on, the Apostle Paul will do the sort of A, B, C, D on the Holy Spirit. And and he'll give us a lot of uh, fantastic teaching. In fact, in the next two weeks, we'll lean into Paul a little bit more because he breaks down the mechanics uh, uh, in, in many ways of the work of the Spirit. But what I love about Luke is, Luke isn't so taken up with the sort of systematic understanding of the Holy Spirit. He just wants to show us, here's what he looks like when he rocks up. Okay, when the Holy Spirit touches Jesus, here's what happens. When the Holy Spirit touches the early church, here's what happens. So when we read the book of Luke and when we read the book of Acts, we're seeing a man not only writing the story of Jesus and writing the story of the church, but he is weaving intimately the story of Jesus and the story of the church into the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, you cannot understand Jesus in the Gospel of Luke without accepting the Holy Spirit in terms of his work in his life. In in, in, in all of the Gospels, Jesus doesn't do any miraculous work before his baptism in water and before he engages with the Holy Spirit. All his miraculous work happens after he has engaged with the Spirit. Now, that could just be a coincidence or that could be a code that we need to at least acknowledge and think about that even though Jesus was God, fully God, and he could have done his miracles as God, the Gospels and the New Testament seems to teach us that Jesus doesn't rely on his Godness to do the miracles, but he relies on the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. And that's a big idea in the Gospel of Luke. And when you get into the book of Acts, it's almost a mirror idea. It's like what we see happening in the early part of Luke is mirrored in the early part of Acts. If you put Luke's, Luke chapter 1 to 4 on one side and the book of Acts chapters 1 and 2 especially on the other side, it's almost like a symmetrical idea. It's like it's a saturation of the Holy Spirit at the beginning of the book of Luke and a saturation of the Holy Spirit at the beginning of the book of Acts. And in fact, if you were to put The 52 chapters of Luke's work together. Luke writes the biggest gospel. And with the book of Acts, Dr. Luke contributes the most words to the New Testament. He's a bigger contributor to the New Testament than Paul. Now, I know you're going to find that hard to believe because Paul writes all those letters. But when you put the words on the table, Dr. Luke is the wordiest person in the New Testament. He contributes about 28% of the New Testament. Massive. Gentile writer, the only Gentile writer in the New Testament. And one of the big ideas Luke talks about is the Holy Spirit. And in those 52 chapters, Luke mentions the Holy Spirit 74 times. Okay, are you with me? Now, why is that important? Because he's saying to us, when you look at the life of Jesus, you cannot ignore the Holy Spirit. When you look at the life of the early church, you cannot ignore the Holy Spirit. So if if you and I arrive from Mars and, and we just picked up the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts and we read it with no denominational agenda, with no labels, with nothing to sort of corrupt our thinking and we just read it, 
the, one of the major conclusions we would come to is we need the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's an undeniable conclusion um, because if, if we just read it as it is, Jesus, can I say this reverently, needed the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you would, might want to push back on that. And I know some of my cessationist friends would push back on that. But Luke seems to show us that Jesus doesn't move into his ministry until he is filled with the Spirit. Jesus tells his young disciples, do not leave until he comes. Do not try to do this on your own. You need the Holy Spirit. And he literally commands them to stay in Jerusalem until they have received the Spirit. So there's almost a mirror image. Jesus waits for the Spirit filling him before he moves into his ministry. The disciples wait for the Holy Spirit before they move into their ministry in the world. And Luke and Acts follow a similar pattern. And the idea is this, and, and again, uh, this is just by way of helping us to think about how we read Luke and Acts. When you see Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 3, and that declaration, the Spirit of the Lord is on me in Luke chapter 4, here's what Luke wants you to do. He wants you to understand that everything Jesus does in the Gospel of Luke is by the power of that Spirit. So that's why Luke doesn't necessarily say every time Jesus does a miracle, he did it by the power of the Spirit. Or every time Jesus speaks a word of demonstration, we oh, did that by the power of the Spirit. Luke doesn't need to do that because he's told us that Jesus from Isaiah says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me and he has anointed me too. So everything you see Jesus doing that links to that declaration of two is by the power of the Spirit. Amen? All right, that's something for you to think about as you read the gospel. Same pattern follows for the early church. He wants us to understand that as the early Christians are filled with the Spirit, that actually the hope is that they will walk with the Spirit, engage with the Spirit, and do their ministry with the help and power of the Spirit. Same sort of idea. With me so far? All right, okay. So Holy Spirit is, is a big idea in the New Testament, but in the Gospel uh, of Luke and the book of Acts, it's a massive idea and you cannot ignore him uh, unless you really, 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 really want to. All right, and, uh, and that's another conversation. So when we look at the life of Jesus, look at the saturation of the references of the Holy Spirit to Jesus in those early verses that I've read you. Holy Spirit descended on him. He was full of the Spirit. He was he led by the Spirit. He returned in the power of the Spirit and the Spirit of the Lord is on me. Uh, and if you include the experiences of Mary, Elizabeth, Zechariah, Simeon and the prophetess Anna who all appear before Jesus in chapter three of Luke, the whole of those first four chapters is saturated with charismatic activity, saturated with the work of the Spirit. Uh, and it, it comes to a sort of climactic crescendo in chapter three and four of Luke in the life of Jesus. The Spirit descends on him. He's full of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, returns in the power of the Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. You just can't ignore that when you put that pattern together. Does that make sense? And as a follower of Jesus, my response to that is not only a, a wonderful worship response, my goodness, look at that, uh, Jesus and his relationship with the Holy Spirit, that's wonderful. But my response all to that is, I, is this, if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, I use the language again, hope that doesn't offend you, but if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, I need the Holy Spirit. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit to do his work, then we need the Holy Spirit to do our work. And I would come to that conclusion myself without even getting to the book of Acts. But the book of Acts reinforces the idea. Is that okay? All right then. So let's think about, let's think about two things that we see, I think, in the, in the life of Jesus and in the early church that are attitudinal. These are attitudes toward 
the Holy Spirit, which I think are really important. And I want to introduce to you right at the beginning of our conversation. There is, first of all, a posture of humility. Now, let me show you this by comparing um, Jesus' baptism with the pouring out of the Spirit with the, uh, with the early disciples in the book of Acts. Now, look what it says in our passage that we read earlier on. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. Now, on first reading, that seems sort of incidental. But if you read the other Gospels, you'll notice that at one point, it's in the Gospel of Matthew, I think, John tries to stop Jesus being baptized. He says, hold on, you should be baptizing me. But in Matthew, Jesus says this, though this has to be done so that all righteousness is fulfilled. So here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus didn't need to be baptized. Not in the way that me and you do. Why not? Okay, I'll answer. I, I didn't necessarily need you to answer. I just want you to think about the question. Why, why, why did Jesus not need to be baptized the way I was baptized? Well, my baptism was a baptism of repentance of sins. All right? That's, that's why you got baptized, because you made a confession that Jesus Christ was Lord, and with that, some sort of repentance toward the sin that, had, that he had paid for on the cross. So our baptism is a baptism of repentance and salvation. His was a baptism of obedience, right? So this is an act of surrender. This is an act of humility. This is an act of Jesus doing something that technically he didn't need to do. He didn't need to be baptized by John and he didn't need to go through the baptism rite the way that John preached it. But he's doing it because the act of baptism is the surrender to the greater purpose of God for that moment. Now, this is a moment of humility. This is a posture. And we sometimes forget this about Jesus, but it's very, very important. Jesus has a posture of humility towards the purpose of God. And I believe it's this posture of humility that positions him to receive the Holy Spirit, to be open to the Holy Spirit. Now look at the mirror effect in the, in the book of Acts. It says, in the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Why were they all together in one place? Because Jesus told them to do that. All right? Are you with me? So this is also an act of obedience. Are you with me? Now, one of the things the Holy Spirit responds to is humility. The thing the Holy Spirit doesn't need from you is perfection. Okay? He doesn't need perfection because if he needed perfection before he came to us, none of us would be filled with the Spirit, right? Right? Come on. It's true, unless I'm like missing something in this room. Uh, none of us would be filled with the Spirit. But that's a very subtle idea that's crept into the church sometimes. Actually, you know, we, we, we need to pray, we need to fast, we need, we, we need to sort of uh, get our behavior in line. Now, are all of those things a good conversation? They actually are. But, but when we look at a biblical pattern, we see that the Holy Spirit over and over again, responds more to humility than he does to perfection. He, he responds to a heart that is obedient and submissive, a heart that says, really, in some ways, through the, through the work of Jesus in the water, going and being baptized, and through the disciples being in one place together, he's really responding to sort of this idea of humility. And he is attracted to, by it. And I think this is one of the big problems for the modern church. The modern church has become reliant on so many things other than the Holy Spirit. Somebody once said this, that if the Holy Spirit was taken away, 85% of churches would carry on as if nothing happened. 
Now, I don't, I, I, it's like an anecdotal sort of throw it out there type of comment, which may or may not have any truth to it. But I, I get to travel up and down this country all the time. And we are less open to the Holy Spirit than we have ever been, in my opinion. Um, so even, even many of our services are so programmed and so, so well worked that actually we really don't need the Holy Spirit. We've got a great band. We've got a decent preacher. We've got an amazing atmosphere, good lights, a beautiful building uh, and cups of coffee afterwards. If we're not careful, that becomes all we need. You've paid your money, take your choice, all right? You can, you can totally disagree with me on any of this, but I'm a card-carrying Pentecostal who's been raised in the Assemblies of God and I think we're less Pentecostal than we've ever been, all right? And here's, here's one of the reasons why. I, I, I don't think there's a humility there that says this, that says this, listen, I need you. And, and the Holy Spirit isn't waiting for you to be perfect. But the Holy Spirit does want us to be humble, to, to actually say, I need you. I need you. Now, one of the things you've got to decide as a follower of Jesus is, do, do you need him? I, I want a position to you that I believe Jesus needed him and that's a difficult idea because Jesus was God. So that'll make your head melt a little bit and I fully understand that some of you in the room may want to disagree with me on that. But Jesus in, a, in the sense of his ministry needed the Holy Spirit. Jesus made it clear to his young disciples they needed the Holy Spirit. Now we've got to ask ourselves the question that individuals and as a church like Bridge, do we need the Holy Spirit or not? Can we survive without him? Or do we need him? Now, how we answer that's going to determine everything. You with me? You sure? Now, that's a challenge. And, and I think that that's something right at the beginning of the journey together is you honestly asking the question, do I need the Holy Spirit? Because when you become convinced you need him, then you'll position yourself towards him. Amen? All right. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that idea as we close, but I'll put that to you. Here's the second thing. I think really the Holy Spirit responds to is this passion of hunger. Look, look at this. Look at, again, the baptism of Jesus. And let's go back to the book of Acts. Look at this. At the baptism of Jesus, it says this, as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended. Now, this could be coincidental that he just happened to be praying when the Holy Spirit came or this could be intentional that actually it's this praying that is creating the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to come. So look at this. Jesus is in the water in an act of humility. Now he's praying in what I believe would be an expression of hunger and desire. In the water, he not only needs the Holy Spirit, he's not only expressing, I need the Holy Spirit, I would argue he's now through prayer expressing, I want the Holy Spirit. I want you to come. I want you to come into my world. Now that, that could be just, I could be just me overcooking that, but look at the pattern again in the book of Acts with his young disciples. It is almost identical, right? Not only are they in the place he told them to be, just as Jesus was in the water when he was uh, asked to, to do that by the Father, but look at this. They all join together constantly in prayer. And look at this, look at this gorgeous reference from Luke, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Look at that. Uh, I love what Luke does. If you, if you read the gospel of Luke in the book of Acts, he's always nudging uh, the, 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 
the image and, and the honor of women in the ministry of the church and in the ministry of Jesus. And I love the little, the fact that he positions the women first there in the context of that. It's a lovely little nod to the fact that there were women in the upper room getting filled with the spirit with the disciples, as we call them, though these are all disciples of Jesus, these women. But, but actually, look what they're doing. They're together constantly in prayer. Now, now, before we move on past this, I want you to see something which is very powerful. Between the moment Jesus left them and the time the Holy Spirit came, 10 days passed. That means what you're reading there wasn't just like for an hour. They are gathering. Now, they would have gone out got food, come back. They would have done other things, right? They wouldn't have been just for 10 days only praying. But you get the impression from the book of Luke that they are positioning themselves in a passion of hunger towards the Holy Spirit. You with me? I, I remember praying for a young man who, was, who responded to an appeal to receive the Holy Spirit. And I said to him, what would you like prayer for? And he said, the Holy Spirit. But I, I knew the way he said it, I wasn't sure. And I said to him, do you want the Holy Spirit? And he said, yeah, sure. Okay. See, we, I didn't offer him a Mars bar. You want a Mars bar? Yeah, sure. Talking about the Holy Spirit. And ladies and gentlemen, listen, we're going to lean into hopefully good teaching that will help you and fill your notepad and things you'll learn about the Holy Spirit. Here's something you've got to learn about the Holy Spirit right at the beginning. He responds to hunger. And if you don't want them, the chances are he'll not come. Are you with me? Now, he's God. He can do anything he wants. So, so even if we barred the doors, he could still turn up and do something supernatural. But the general principle of the biblical narrative is that God responds to humility and hunger. Is that fair? You think that's okay? I, and I think that's one of the challenges for me and you. Are we hungry for him? Now, the fact that you're here means in some way you are. But, but here's what I want to challenge you with. I don't want this to become an intellectual process. John, just tell us about the Holy Spirit. I, one of the things I, I want to do is tell you about the Holy Spirit from the, from the New Testament and from the Bible, but, but I, I also want you to be open to this, this, these two questions. Do I, do I need him? Do I want him? I can't answer that for you. Cookie can't answer that for you. Aaron can't. Cookie's certainly not answering it for you now. He's in Mexico just chilling out, taking it easy on holiday. But, but actually no pastor, no leader, no small group, no spouse can answer that question for you. Only you can answer that question. Are you hungry? Amen? Come on, you still there? You still love me? You're all looking at me very serious. Um, but, but this is an important idea. So, that, so before we even jump into what does all this look like, attitudinally, these are crucial ideas. And if we as a church community don't really believe we need him, then we won't ask for him to come. And, and even if we're sort of convinced, yeah, yeah, we probably do need the Holy Spirit, but if we don't want him. Yeah, and I need you to think about that because, because that's an important attitudinal position. Whatever, you're, whatever you understand theologically about the Holy Spirit, I think attitudinally he responds to that. And, it, and back in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus uh, teaches about receiving the Holy Spirit. And here's what he says, just a beautiful thing. He says, uh, when you ask, 
and you see and you knock. He says, if, if a child asks their, their father for a piece of bread, will he, will he give them a stone? If they ask for a fish, will he give them a snake? Of course not. Even, even fathers who in comparison to God are sort of, uh, you know, wicked in comparison to God, give good gifts to their children. He says this, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to what? Come on, what does it say? To those who ask him. Now, asking implies, I need you and I want you. Come on, are you with me? And, and I, I don't want to rush past that. I, I think that's, that's one of the big ideas I want you to hear tonight. Now, even if you're like me, you've been a Christian a million years. Do you need him? Do you want him? If you're a baby Christian, and this is the first time you've heard this conversation, then I want to introduce you to, to two attitudes that will serve you for the rest of your life. Humility and hunger. Humility and hunger. I need you. I want you. Amen? So, so this says, just as humility says, I need you, hunger says, I want you. Yes? Do we want him. Now, only you can answer, only I can answer that for me. When we widen it out to the church, the bridge, the church of Jesus Christ in the, new, in, in, in the United Kingdom, the church of Jesus Christ across the world, do we need him? Do we want him? I think that's a crucial question for the 21st century because I, I think we're living in the most some of the most scary, difficult moments in the history of the world. But I also believe we're living in perhaps the most opportune moments in the history of the world as far as the gospel is concerned. And the Holy Spirit is wanting to be a part of that with us and wants us to be a part of that with him. Does that make sense? So as we draw to the end of the gospel of Luke, Jesus says this, if you were to read the end of Luke chapter 24 and jump straight into Acts chapter 1, it's like a seamless connection. The, the, the little challenge we have in our New Testament bit of the Bible is that we've got John smack back in the middle between Luke and Acts, which is a bit of a shame because if you read from Luke 24 into Acts 1, you're just getting the beautiful flow through from Dr. Luke. And right at the end of Luke 24, Jesus says, but stay in the city until you have have been clothed with power from on high. And then we jump into the bit we read tonight. He says, again, repeats it to them, stay here until the Holy Spirit comes. And then he says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. But this, this little phrase throws up um, a little challenge we have because when it comes to engaging with the Holy Spirit, especially in the New Testament, there are different phrases that are used. Here's, here's some of the big ones. You may have come across this. And in fact, we, we've seen these already in the, in the passages that we've read. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's implied in Acts chapter one. Receive the promise. Now, all of this will be in your notes. So the references will be in your notes. Receive the gift to come on, to fall on, or to be poured out on. Now, they're not describing different experiences. They're all describing the same thing. But they're describing it in such a gorgeous, sort of expansive way that we can see that actually this experience of the Holy Spirit has such a range and depth and, and height to it that it needs different ideas to try and help us understand what is going on. In the Gospel of Luke and in the book of Acts, Dr. Luke's favorite phrase is this, filled with, filled with. In fact, in the New Testament, filled with the Spirit is used nine times and Dr. Luke uses it eight of the nine. The only other reference is by Paul in the book of Ephesians when he says to us, be continuously filled with the Spirit. Some of you will know uh, that reference, okay? So, so you get this idea of filled with and baptism and poured out on and all of these incredible, incredible uh, descriptions of this experience. Now hold that thought 
why we take you this way. So in Acts chapter two, verses one to four, which is the bit that we read, the Holy Spirit comes on the first believers. And, and those believers are probably almost entirely, if not completely, Jewish. Okay? So if you read that carefully, it's probably Jewish believers, that first wave of Jewish believers. And the Holy Spirit comes on them. And when the Holy Spirit comes on them, there's some amazing supernatural signs, but they speak in tongues or they speak in these other languages as a verbal demonstration of the power of the Spirit. In fact, if you read on in the book of Acts chapter 2, 17 languages are referenced being heard in their own language as these disciples speak in tongues. And they're hearing God being glorified in their own language from people who can't speak that language. It's quite amazing. And, uh, and so there's this supernatural verbal expression. Now, in, in, in this passage, tongues of fire come on them. There's a, a wind in the room. There's some extra stuff going on there, which is probably symptomatic of the fact it's the first moment that the Holy Spirit is coming in power in that way. And therefore, it has some standout events within it. But one of the big ideas is that these believers are filled with power and they speak in other languages. Okay, hold that thought. The second big outpouring in the book of Acts is in Samaria. Now again, I would really encourage you to look at these, but in Samaria, in, in Acts chapter 8, it talks about the believers in Samaria. They've been baptized in water and then Peter and John go up and lay their hands on the Samaritan believers and they get filled with the Spirit. Now, when it comes to this one, there's no um, record of what happens when the Holy Spirit comes on them, right? We don't know if they spoke in tongues. We don't know if there was any other verbal or physical demonstration. We just know it was so amazing that Simon the sorcerer wanted to buy it. All right, so it was so outstanding as an experience that a man who had practice in the occult wanted to buy the power of Peter. And you can read that for yourself. So we don't know what happened there, but it was pretty outstanding for Simon the sorcerer to want it. You with me so far? Then the third outpouring, so we've got Jewish outpouring, Forgive that if you don't agree, but almost entirely Jewish. Second outpouring of the Spirit is to Samaritans. Third outpouring of the Spirit uh, is to Gentiles. This is Cornelius' household, a, a centurion. It's an amazing story. And, and when the Spirit comes on them, again, there is verbal demonstration. There is the, this, there's a sense of uh, not only speaking in tongues, but prophesying. There's, there's a, a dynamic physical experience that actually happens as Peter is preaching. And the Holy Spirit comes on them in an amazing way. And again, there's these demonstrations. And then lastly, the last outpouring, and this is almost coming full circle because we started with John's baptism in the Gospel of Luke. We now come back to a bunch of John's disciples and they bump into Paul. They have this interesting conversation. Paul ends up leading them to Jesus and then he uh, lays hands on them and they get filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesy and speak in tongues. Now I want you to notice a couple of things because this is really, really important and helpful for us. In between chapters 8 and 9, you have Paul being filled with the Spirit, but virtually nothing said about it. And it's the only example of an individual being filled with the Spirit as an individual in the book of Acts. It's really quite striking. Every other time someone gets filled with the Holy Spirit, they're in a group. Okay? They're in a group. Okay? Now, now notice this, because... Something really profound here going on that the Holy Spirit wants us to see. The first group is Jewish. The second group is Samaritan. The third group is Gentile. And they're all experiencing the same thing. So the Holy Spirit is not just working on one group, one type of person, or only engaging with a certain idea. He is pouring himself out on all these ethnic groups. He wants all men and women everywhere who have repented to come to a place of faith. Now look, look at this. In Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes as they're praying. Nobody touches them. 
In Acts chapter 10, the Spirit comes as Peter is preaching. Nobody touches them. So the Holy Spirit can come without anybody touching you, anybody engaging with you. You don't have to have hands laid on you to be filled with the Spirit. Because in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes. And in Acts chapter 10, the Spirit comes without anybody touching anybody. In Acts chapter 8 and Acts chapter 19, hands are laid on. So that's also a pattern that can happen. That actually we can pray for one another to receive the Holy Spirit. But with the exception of Acts chapter 8, because we don't really know what's going on there, in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 10, in Acts chapter 19, there is dynamic verbal response to the Holy Spirit coming on you. When the Holy Spirit fills you, in every single time, there is a verbal reaction. Speaking in tongues. In fact, um, I don't know what the Assemblies of God position is now, but certainly our historic position was the initial evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit was speaking in tongues. Now, some people would disagree with that position, uh, and, and I, I, I don't want to get into it now because it's really a matter of how we interpret a text. But the pattern of the book of Acts is definitely verbal response to the coming of the Holy Spirit. Something that, and not just me talking too much, it's a supernatural verbal response, prophesying and or speaking in tongues. With me so far? And in the one bit that's not referenced, Simon wants to buy it. Okay? Now, this is the, these patterns are important. Dr. Luke is including these because they're really important for us. Because actually the Holy Spirit can come in your bedroom without anybody touching you. But the Holy Spirit can come when a man or a woman of God puts their hands on you and prays for you. The Holy Spirit can come to an individual because he does that with Paul, but the Holy Spirit can also come in groups. The Holy Spirit isn't just working on one type of person, but he wants to come to all humble and hungry hearts. He will come to all of us if we welcome him into this place. Uh, and the common factor seems to be that all of these people have previously Come to faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? So, so, so there's, a, there's patterns there that really, really help us. Now, I'm drawing this in the land, so you'll be glad to hear. But let me, let, let me say a couple of things. From these expressions, baptism, filled with, power on, clothed, fall upon, come upon. And then these experiences, Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. Is there anything we can learn about the filling of the Spirit in our lives? Okay, and I think there are. And I think there are three big ideas that are really crucial to help us understand if the Holy Spirit has filled us or not. Because this was a big question that Paul asked the disciples of John. Have you been filled with the Spirit? And they didn't really, they couldn't really answer the question. All right, so, so, so what do we learn? First thing is this, being filled with the Holy Spirit is a distinct event. Now, what do we mean by that? We mean this, that there is a coming to faith and then there is a filling with the Spirit. Now, before you ask the question, let me try and answer it for you. John, don't we need the Holy Spirit to come to faith? We do. In fact, the Holy Spirit leads us to faith. And Paul makes that very, very clear. And one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to form Jesus in us. So we can't even become Christians without the Holy Spirit. But of course, what we're looking at here in the book of Acts is a dynamic empowering of the Spirit as distinct from the moment the Holy Spirit led us to Christ in faith. So you can be, so, so this, is, this is my belief, you can be a follower of Jesus and believe in Jesus and not filled with the Holy Spirit in the way that is described in the book of Acts. All right? Now, does that make you less a Christian? Of course not. 
Of course not. And this has been one of the great misunderstandings, sometimes from the arrogance of the Pentecostal movement and sometimes from how it's been misunderstood by those who don't believe in this. Of course not. If I claim to be filled with the Spirit in the way the book of Acts describes, and my brother who doesn't believe in that experience hasn't been filled, is he less a follower of Jesus? Is he less saved than me? No, of course not. Is he a lesser Christian? Of course not. Don't go there. Don't, don't trumpet that sort of uh, arrogant nonsense because that's very hurtful and it's very unhelpful for the work of the Holy Spirit. But, but I, I, I liken it this way. It would be, it would be like having a, an amazing car sitting on your driveway, but it just is not juiced up. So my car's a hybrid. It's a plug-in petrol uh, and actually, if I want the power, I've got to plug it in. Or if I want power, I've got to fill it up. Now, now, it's a beautiful car. It will always be a beautiful car. But if there's no petrol in it and there's no juice in it, it just sits there on my drive. Is it any less a car? No. But it's not able to do what it was fully designed to do because I'm ignoring a complete a really powerful element. If you haven't been filled with the Spirit in the book of Acts sense that I've tried to explain today, are you less a Christian? Am I less a Christian? No, not at all. But I would argue we're missing out on a dynamic experience, a distinct experience that can help me and you do everything we were meant to do. Does that make sense? Oh, it's quiet. All right, okay, here's the second thing. Being filled with the Spirit according to the book of Luke and the book of Acts is a dynamic experience. Now, now please hear what I'm about to say. Please do not be offended. But if I say to you tonight, and this is, this is part of the provocation, and we're not just here to teach, we're also here to hopefully minister and encourage. If I said to you, have you been filled with the Spirit like the book of Acts sense, the bit that we've read tonight, and you don't know, then you probably haven't. All right? Because, now here's the reason I say that, because every single example of the Holy Spirit coming on someone, both in the Old Testament, but profoundly in the New Testament, they know. So let, let me give you some examples. If I, if I took you to a swimming pool and dunked you under the water, would you know? You would. Why? Because I've baptized you. I have literally buried you in the water. If I took my coat off you, off me and put it on you, would you know? Yes. If I literally climbed on top of your back, and put myself upon you, would you know? Yeah. If I, if I handed you a nice big jug of water and made you drink that until you could drink no more, would you know? Yes. So, so the point is, please, please forgive. Please forgive me for that. But I've met so many beautiful Christians, and this, is, this has happened because of the growth of the charismatic movement, the charismatic movement has stretched the understanding of being filled with the Spirit. And I've met beautiful, beautiful people who, who believe they're filled with the Holy Spirit but can't define the moment or an experience or a point where he came. Now, I think if we went back to the book of Acts, the early believers could pinpoint the moment. Now, some of you won't like that. You'll disagree with me on that, but that's my conviction. And I think that's part of the problem we have today. When you minimize the dynamic, it's hard to define when he comes. You with me? All right, maybe you are, maybe you're not. I'm not, I'm not sure where you are, to be quite honest. So, so uh, um, it's hard to read the room. But I, I sat with a pastor who was really adamant to me 
that tongues, for example, was not the sign of being filled with the Spirit. So we pushed back on that. And I said, okay, that's fine. I said, but how do you then know someone has had a supernatural experience with the Holy Spirit? And he, he didn't really know. He couldn't. And that's the problem. I, I have no problem someone saying to me, I don't believe tongues is the sign that you're filled with the Spirit. I don't believe tongues has to be the sign. That's cool. But here's what I'm saying to you. If you follow the Book of Acts pattern, everybody knew. It's a dynamic experience. Dynamic. Now, I don't want to talk about my experience because I don't want to pose, impose what happened to me with the Holy Spirit on you because then people thought, what well, has to happen like that? No, I think the book of Acts gives us a variety of experiences because it wants to show us that it can happen in different ways to different people at different times. Some get their hands let on, some don't, some mid-preach, some not. It's all different moments the Holy Spirit comes, but the common denominator for them all, they knew. Amen? Okay? And that's what I'm appealing for as I speak to Pentecostals. We've got to know. Got to know. All right? Here's the third thing about the Holy Spirit. I think it's a directional expectation. So when the Holy Spirit comes on us, one of the things, when, we, when we've encountered the power of the Holy Spirit, one of the things that should happen according to the book of Acts, according to the pattern of the life of Jesus, is that that Holy Spirit will want to push us out to the world. So, so this being filled with the Spirit is not just for me to have a cool experience and, and like, you know, really enjoy that for myself and more Lord, more Lord. Absolutely, I'm, I'm into all that. It's all marvelous. But, but actually... When you look at Jesus, when you look at the early church, when you look at the book of Luke, when you look at the book of Acts, you've got a pattern of when the Holy Spirit comes is so that we will go. He wants to come so that we will go. And this is, this is the crux of the matter. This is why we need him. We, we, we don't just need him to sort of, you know, get through a day, but we need him in order to help us reach our world supernaturally. Help us touch our world in the way that Jesus touched that world, in the way that maybe the early church touched that world, that actually he wants us to be filled with that power. Uh, and, and I, I, you know, having said everything I've said about dynamic supernatural evidence that you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, this dynamic events uh, experience that, that shows you have been filled, for me, the ultimate, the ultimate expression that you've been filled with the Spirit is that we start looking outward. That's why we need him more than anything, more than anything. We need the power of the Spirit because there is a desperately broken world out there that needs a supernatural church. I think that's my conviction. Now, you feel free to disagree with me, but that is my conviction. Yes? And so what does that look like? Well, I, I think it's the power to be. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. We need the Holy Spirit so that we can be his witnesses, not do witnessing, but be his witnesses, be. And when the Holy Spirit is helping us, then we go into our world as beings, not just, well, let's do some programs, but being his witness. So, so we can be his witness everywhere we go, not just when we have a programmed event in the, in the bridge, but we can be those witnesses every single place we go. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is with us. We have the power, according to the book of Acts, to do Look at these amazing words of Jesus. He says, you will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And of course, if you read that carefully in John 14, it's because he's sending the Holy Spirit to us. Lord, to see those things. To see you move in power in us. The power to give is in the life of the Spirit. Look at these words. Uh, he, Peter says to the man, uh, lying at the gate beautiful in Acts chapter 3. He said, I can't give you silver and gold because I don't have that, but what I have, I give to you. And when it comes to the life of the Spirit, we cannot 
give what we do not have. Amen. Last idea. I'm drawing it to a close for you'll be glad to hear. The power to go. The power to go. You will be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And, and here's what we see in the book of Acts ultimately. The overwhelming consequence of the coming of the Spirit will be a going church. When, when we used to take missions trips to different parts of the world, especially when I worked at Rotherham, we, we took on average seven missions trips a year. And it was remarkable to see people who would turn up to church every week at Rotherham and sort of just like, like there were good people, but they would just sort of come and go that serve and, but, but, you know, just, just go sort of go through the motions. Then, then you take them on a missions trip where they're suddenly confronted with stuff they don't normally get confronted with in Rotherham. Suddenly, uh, you know, a sick, dying child is handed up and there's no hospital. Suddenly, demons are in the room uh, and they're screaming and they're shouting and they're coming for you. Suddenly, you're presented with poverty that is so mind-numbing that money alone isn't going to fix it. Suddenly, you're confronted with stuff that makes you feel totally impotent. And the amount of times... When on those trips, that's when people realized, I need the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? It's, it's that sense of, oh my goodness, without his power, we cannot do this. My conclusion for you is this, it is the end of this first week. Reading Luke and Acts, there's only one conclusion. We need the Holy Spirit. Now, the challenge that I want to present to you at the beginning of this journey, is do you? The posture that he responds to is, I need you. The attitude that he loves is, I want you. Humility and hunger are things that he is after. I've tried to show us from the experience of Jesus and from the book of Acts that Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, the church needed the Holy Spirit, and that the engagement with the Holy Spirit was a distinct, dynamic, and directional experience. And I would argue this, brothers and sisters, nothing has changed. The 21st century world looks different from the first century world, but it's sort of the same underneath the difference. Nothing has changed. The same gospel, same Jesus, same Holy Spirit, same call, same mission, same world, same church. And actually, there is a call to us to be open to him. And, and if you're here and you have already been filled with the Spirit, uh, I, I want to encourage you, even if it, over these next few weeks, to be afresh, open and say, Holy Spirit, I, 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 want to, I want to be continuously filled with your life and with your power and intentionally invite him into your world. If, you, if you're looking at this explanation in the book of Acts and God, I'm not sure what you've described as what I've had. Then actually, over these next weeks, we want to be open to pray for you and minister to you if you want that in order for you to receive the Holy Spirit or even in the, in the privacy of your home or in your small groups when you're gathering together, actually pray for one another that the Holy Spirit will come. But I, I urge you, I, I urge you be open to him. Don't be afraid. He's not here to hurt you. He's not here to wound you. He's not here to manipulate you. He is God. He loves you and he wants to bless you in the most abundant way. So we finish with these ideas. Holy Spirit, I need you. Lord, put within us a need for you. A need. A deep calling to deep. I need you. Holy Spirit, I want you. 
Lord, will you put a hunger in our hearts for you? A hunger that goes beyond all the stuff we have. A hunger that goes beyond our sophistication. A hunger that goes beyond our own, even our own human ability. A hunger that calls out to you. It says, I want you. Would you put that within us? Would you make us hungry? Would you make us hungry for you, Lord? And then Holy Spirit, I welcome you. And ladies and gentlemen, wherever the Holy Spirit finds, I need you, I want you, and I welcome you, he comes. Now there's a sense in which he's already come. He's here. But he will come to us. He will come to where we are. He will fill our hearts and fill our lives and give us all that we need. Amen? Now, my, my time is gone, and, and you've all had long days, so I'm not going to keep you here much longer. But before we rush off and the noise begins, I do want us to be open just to the Holy Spirit, to these ideas. I do want us, if we want to, to create the moment where we go, Lord, we welcome you to this place. Now, if you can, would you stand with me? If you can't stand, please stay sitting, be comfortable. Next week, we'll talk about the gifts of the Spirit, what that looks like. Amazing, amazing gifts. Week three, we'll think about the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit shaping and forming the nature of God within us. Magnificent stuff. But there is a, there is a gateway into all of these things. Jesus, full of the Spirit, returned in the power of the Spirit and declared, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. And we are here today, not just because Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, but because Jesus did those things, I believe, helped and empowered by the Holy Spirit. He didn't do them alone. He didn't do them in his own strength. He did them by the power of the Spirit. We marvel at the early church, ordinary men, ordinary women, fishermen, carpenters, tax collectors, husbands, wives, children, empowered by the Spirit, who in the space of a generation went from a fringe cult community to touching the very heart of the Roman Empire. They didn't do that because they were brilliant, although many of them were. They didn't do it because they had amazing technology in fact, they had a fraction of the, the resources that you and I enjoy today. But the book of Acts tells us they did that by the power of the Spirit. With the word of God in their hearts and the power of the Spirit upon their lives. And as I'm about to pray, I, I just want you to open up your heart. I want you this week to answer the question, do I need the Holy Spirit? To answer the question, do I want the Holy Spirit? And if you and I will come to that place of both humility and honesty, I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Spirit will respond in the most magnificent way to each of us. If there's something in your heart that wants to respond to those words right now, even just where you're standing, his eyes are closed in this place quietly, humbly, even lift our hands to heaven 
stretch out our hands in front of us towards heaven, towards the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I need you. Holy Spirit, I want you. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters tonight. Lord, we've gathered here today around your word because there is something within us that wants to know and grow and learn. And Lord, I thank you for the desire to know and grow and learn. But Holy Spirit, I also pray that within our hearts, within each of us, you will put a deep hunger. A deep hunger that cries from the depths of our being. Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, we want you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Lord, when we look at Jesus, when we look at the book of Acts, we don't want these things to be sort of fairy tales to us. We don't want, just want them to be stories. We want them to be our lived experience. We want to be a church, a bridge church filled with the Holy Spirit. We want to be followers of Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit. We want to be men and women full of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, I pray that you will come to each one of us in the privacy of our homes, in the, in the intimacy of our walk, in our small groups, Lord, wherever we are, that, Lord, there will be a, a hunger and a humility towards you that will beckon you to each one of us, that will beckon you, Lord God, to the very depths of our being, so that, Lord, there will be a cry from our hearts, a cry from this place that would say, Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, we want you. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, we want to thank you that you are here, that we are not orphans, that we have not been left alone, but that you are here with us and you are here for us. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray, touch every heart, touch every life in this place, touch every mind, that Lord Jesus, from the depths of our being, there will be a cry and a desire for you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Blessed be your name, O Lord. Blessed be your name, O Lord. Blessed be your name, O Lord. Lord, may this this church, this house become an altar of hunger and passion for you. May this community be a community of humility that Lord, with all that we have and all that we are, there will always be an understanding that we need you more than anything else. Holy Spirit, may we be a people walking with you and may we be a people filled with your power, filled with your presence and filled with your glory. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, let it be so. Amen. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening. Thank you for coming tonight. But this week, lean into that. Be open, be hungry. Answer the questions, call on him and let him come to where you are. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much.